All right, welcome back. Episode 173 of Chaotically Intolerant. We have a lot to talk about today. We're going to go over the news, um, but we are like prepping for that big playoff push. You know, uh, baseball, we're coming down on the final week of August here and uh, September. You know, that's that's it. September call-ups, all that stuff. Um, we'll do a grid too, um, probably a football grid, uh, but make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and let's go. All right. So, Mike, let's let's get started on the NFL front because we had football this weekend. Some some real real regular season football. Now week 0 is a little odd, you know, for compared to the NFL. They have changed some rules up so they do have a 2-minute warning now, which is I don't know your opinion on that. I know college football fans aren't happy about the 2-minute warning, but I think it's fine. Yeah, they should have a 2. I don't know why they haven't had a 2-minute warning at this point. Yeah. Maybe just because the and clock then, stops on first downs anyway, so. Probably. I would assume that's it. Um, but uh, FSU falling to Georgia State is probably the funniest way that FSU season could have started after all of the screaming and crying last season about how they deserve to get in. They really thought so. Even Nick Saban coming out before the game saying, you know, I feel like FSU should have had a spot. And then they lose to Georgia State, who does have a very good offense, but. If you're a national championship team, you play in the ACC, you got you got to win your opener. You just have to, especially in in Ireland. You, it's it's just hilarious. They maybe they didn't play their starters in this game. I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, FSU gets a last second field goal to lose. Any thoughts on that, Mike? No, but you're right. Have, had FSU won, they really could have solidified their uh, their case for last year. Yeah. Um, and it is it is weird because, you know, this is the new format, the new playoff format. Now FSU has a shot. You know, there, there's still like a very reasonable chance they will make the playoff. Um, they'll probably be, you know, I, I would assume outside the top five because that five spot seems like destined for Notre Dame every year. Um, they're just that that is like the Notre Dame spot. Number five. They're just like, here, you don't play a conference, you know, take it. This is yours every single year. Um, but I, I like the, the format. Again, the 12-team format might be a little too much, but uh, I, I would rather take more college football games, especially that they're going to be playing them at the home stadiums versus at neutral sites. I, I really like that. Yeah, I, I, I do too. Other or NFL news, uh, the NFL is expected to allow private equity firms to purchase up to 10% of NFL teams. I feel like this was coming, right? Like with the NFL, it's just another, how are we going to make money? How can we, you know, just involve more money into the NFL? I, I was on uh, Unstabled last night. We were talking about it. The NFL money just doesn't exist. It's not really real anymore. They just, you know, you give CD Lamb a $136 million contract over four years, 100 guaranteed. Like, it's just not not real money. But, you know, you can, you can invest in an NFL team and hopefully soon. You know, that'd be pretty cool to uh, be able to throw a little money, throw a little cash in there. I mean, yeah, at this point, starting a season in Brazil, I don't know that I ever thought I'd see the day. And, uh, so here we go, right? I mean, private equity, for, it's it's crazy. Yeah. Crazy. Um, um, who who would you invest in right now? Uh, who would I invest in? Well, it would be too easy to pick a team like the Chiefs. I, I would invest in a team like the Bears, maybe. Yeah. Big Definitely. city needs a winner. Buying low. Yeah. Yeah. Buy low, sell high. The Bears is like probably the perfect chance right now. I feel like sneaky Buffalo might be a good one to kind of buy in on. I feel yeah, like their stock so is a little cursed. lower. They're so cursed. <laughs> they are, but you know, that they get there. At least they get there, right? Like there's teams like the Browns who just don't even get there. They don't even... They don't even give you the chance to lose money. They don't even give you the chance to be sad, right? Like, they're just always sad. Mm -hmm. um, the Kelsey brothers just got a $100 million podcast deal with Wondery, who is owned by Amazon. Um, it's also expected that 
Jeff Bezos will be involved in the Celtics sale at some point. It's, you know, who knows? But having Jeff Bezos as a Celtics owner, I feel like that would just be over for the NBA. It would just, that would be it. You're just going to sign every big name free agent possible. I mean, good for the Kelsey bros, I guess. They they have more than enough money. Yeah, I mean, rich get richer, right? Um, yeah. Saw the Chiefs parted ways with Kadarius Tony. Yes, I was going to mention that as well. Um, Tony is uh, finally gone. I think it was a lot later than we expected, to say mm-hmm. the least. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there was, you know, that whole thing with, like, when he was injured and all that. It has some weird stuff that's happened over time with him. Uh, but somebody, yeah, will, I think I, uh, somebody will take a chance on him. I really do. Somebody should. Uh, I maybe Maybe Jacksonville. Like Jacksonville, you don't really have a true wide receiver one there. Tony, say what you want. I feel like he has the skill to be a wide receiver one. I mean, he was a wide receiver one in college. He's he's a physical specimen. Um, why wouldn't Jacksonville, you know, take a shot? I don't know what their cap situation is, but it seems like that wouldn't really hurt. You can probably get him on a league minimum deal. And if he sucks, well, you're the Jacks. You you can deal with it. <laughs> you You don't really have like much better of wide receivers right now. Yeah. Yeah. Jacksonville would make sense. I mean, a contending team, you would think. Yeah. Would roll the dice on him. Maybe Miami. OBJ is going to be out the next four or the first four games of the year, at least. Um, Miami's a perfect spot for him, too. Yeah. A lot of speed in that kind of high flying offense. Sure. Warm yeah. weather. Yeah. Um, I, I want to do a little something. So we. Uh, we do neglect the other aspect of the show that I really like to cover um, is like TV, movie news, stuff like that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about it, a little more nerdy stuff. You know, First off, Gambit, uh, the, there was a deleted scene released from Deadpool and Wolverine. Um, he basically sees the, uh, what do they call it, sparkle circles, magic spar- or marble sparkle circles in the void. And it's going to be expected that he does jump through and escapes the void. And hopefully that's teasing a Gambit movie. I know uh, Channing Tatum really was interested in that. I'd love to see it. The accent was ridiculous, but I think that was kind of the goal. Um, I really would love to see a whole movie just with Channing Tatum and that crazy Louisiana accent. Um, just And, and I, I want to see Channing Tatum succeed. He seems like a pretty good guy. Um, he, you know, was a stripper before he was an actor. And so it... You know, maybe bring in a little Magic Mike gambit. I'd love to see that. Quentin Tarantino was talking about the Toy Story trilogy today, and he said that uh, he doesn't even need to watch Toy Story 4. They did it perfectly on 1 through 3. Again, I wholeheartedly agree. I don't know why they made Toy Story 4. They're making Toy Story 5. Stop bleeding that well dry. Just, you know, you almost killed him off in in an incinerator in Toy Story 3. One of the most emotional scenes I've ever seen in a kid's movie. They're holding hands as they're being pushed towards fire, like literally just a large incinerator, and the little alien guys come and scoop them up. There's no reason to make a Toy Story 5. I didn't want to see Toy Story 4. I don't even, I and I'm never going to see it. Um, but yeah, leave it at three. And yeah, Tarantino, I, I don't always agree with him on a lot of his movie takes. I, I think the superhero movies are good and bad. I, I know a lot of directors like him are, against superhero movies in general i think it's good it's at least keeping movies going and they saved you could say they saved theaters um in the last 10 years since things have moved over to streaming services there's still people showing up to watch deadpool and wolverine at the theaters there's a pretty cool batman popcorn bucket coming out too just stuff like that with comic books it's really important for movie theaters so i don't agree with them on that but uh yeah let's let's just keep toy story at three Unless you just want to completely reboot it, go to a completely different universe. But even then, don't need to do that. And then the final one, Spider-Man 4 with Tom Holland is expected to now be a multiverse story. And it's not going to be grounded as the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. I'm getting sick and tired of the multiverse stuff. I just want to see a grounded Spider-Man going around trying to work at the Daily Bugle. Maybe trying to just get through college while also being Spider-Man and doing like the day-to-day stuff of you know saving saving a cat out of a tree that type of stuff i just want to see a friendly neighborhood spider-man doing those small things and i feel like now that with this multiverse thing they're doing we won't get to see that for a long time we eventually we will get to see it i'd love to see like an indie director 
do something like that. And, you know, maybe just like a YouTube movie or something. I'd love to be involved in that. Uh, I love Spider-Man. I am a bigger DC guy, but I do love Spider-Man. He is, my girlfriend always says she, I remind her of Spider-Man for some reason. I don't, I don't really get it. No, not a bad thing at all. It's good. I'm more of a Superman guy though. I'd love for her to say, Hey, you remind me of, of Superman, but uh, Spider-Man's a good one too. Cool kid. You know, the whole thing. Let's move. We're going to go to our grid real quick, and then we'll start on baseball. Um, we're going to do a football grid here. Uh, let me find out how to share my screen. Here we go. All right. So we got Washington, Seattle, and 3,000 yards passing on the top in a season. And we got Cleveland, Tennessee, and Baltimore on the bottom. Um, feel like the 3,000 yards passing season Probably the easiest one to start out with. That though, but I mean, like, it feels like because they've had a zillion terrible quarterbacks. You got to go back. You got to. You probably got to go go way. Bernie Kosar, right? Or or Otto Graham? I mean, I don't know how. Even I don't even. Did Otto Graham have a three thousand yard pass? Probably not. I probably (laughs) played like ten games back then. I feel like Kosar is the easy one. Do you think Tim Couch did it? Uh, I don't know. Maybe Kelly Holcomb when he took over for Couch. They were kind of a. No, actually, like I a don't committee. think so. I think, uh, has Watson done it yet? I feel like Watson just hasn't played enough. He's, yeah. When's the la- when was he, out. when was the last time he played like almost a full season? Maybe he missed one game. It, it had to have been with Houston, right? Yeah, probably. I mean, the only one I feel confident in at this point is, is Kozar. Yeah. Let's go Kozar. He's only a lot of anymore. Yeah. Uh, Titans, you know, you, you'd have to go McNair, right? McNair, go Vince Young, right? Yeah, I'm sure he topped. He had to. Have. I'm sure Tannehill uh, did. Tannehill definitely did. What's a... I, Warren I wonder, Moon, like, the old... What's that? <laughs> no. Char- what about, like, Charlie Whitehurst? Well, I, I was going to say maybe, uh, what's his name? Warren Moon, but that, you know, because the Titans were the Houston Oilers. That's true. Yeah, you can do the Oilers. Let's do. Let's go retro. Let's keep it on the retro. This would be good, especially for Draft America um, and the socials for you guys. Let's go uh, Warren Moon. All right. Let's see. Let, let's. Okay. Yeah. Right. I mean, it, that was a high flying offense. They had to have had at least three thousand yeah, yards. Yeah. Three thousand yards for the Ravens. Well, they, you know, they haven't had that many quarterbacks. I think, you know, Vinny Testaverde is first year. They, their first, second year, they put up a lot of yards in the air. I mean, they were like, they went four and 12 the first year. So I, I'd have to think he topped 3,000. Because, you know, obviously you could go Flacco. Maybe even go yeah. McNair, right? I mean, McNair was a Raven in 06 and part of 07. He got hurt in 07 and never played again. Yeah, I'm trying to think if there's anyone else in the Ravens that, you know, in their history, they had Har- J- uh, Jim Harbaugh played for the Ravens in 98. First Ravens game I ever went to, he was actually the quarterback. Um, Tony Banks put up pretty good numbers, you know. I mean, Anthony Wright had this, like, one amazing uh, half a season, basically, in 03, led him to the playoffs. And then, you know, it's but then it's from 08 to for, like, a decade, Flacco, and then now, obviously, Lamar. But uh, let's go Vinny. Let's see if Vinny got to 3,000 in 96. I mean, he had to have. Boom. Yeah, there we go. There we go. All right. Seahawks, Browns. You got Seahawks, Titans, and Seahawks, Ravens. Okay, I I got a Seahawks, Browns. Uh, Do you remember Joe Juravicious? I do not. Joe Juravicious went to three Super Bowls in a six-year span with three different teams, and then he went to the Browns. And I'm sure never experienced any winning again. No, Jurevish is with a J. I think it's J-U-R. Here we go. So he played. He was great. I mean, he was huge uh, in 2002 for the Bucs. And and he was dealing with a really serious situation with his young son passed away. And that was kind of like a big story at the time. Also went to the Super Bowl with the Giants when they got beat down by the Ravens. And then he went to the Super Bowl with Seattle when they got robbed by the referees against Pittsburgh. So he he was on a lot of winning teams, yeah, for the most part until you know until he went to the Browns. Titans, Seahawks. You go Hasselbeck. Yeah, of course. Can you go Hasselbeck? Now, yeah, he was wait on a the minute. Titans. Did, 
Did um, I don't know what Chris Johnson never played for the Seahawks, right? He played maybe for Arizona at the end of his career, and maybe Seattle. I think Hasselbeck's the safe bet. I was just curious. Yeah, I don't know. Hold on, Tim or Matt? Well, uh, Matt was the Seahawk. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Tim that was, one was of the Tim ones. did play for the Redskins for a minute there in the early two thousands. Yeah. Um, Seahawks Ravens. Well, actually, Seahawks Ravens. I could give you one for sure. Uh, Michael McCrary. I'm pretty sure played for Seattle before he came to the Ravens and, and helped them win a Super Bowl in 2000. MCCR. There we go. Point eight. Good. Yeah, nice. The rarity really score. Good one. I mean, he was really a big part of uh, that Super Bowl team, a really good defensive end there for a number mm-hmm. of years. All right, now we got to get all these ex Washington uh, people. Okay, let's see. Well, I got one, one good one for Washington, Tennessee. When you think about big contract busts huge defensive lineman got a big contract and he was a bit of a troublemaker once stepped on a guy's head does i don't know if that gives you a clue because this was back in the mid 2000s and he actually was a patriot for a minute at the end of his career so i'm gonna see if i can stump you on this let me think here it was in the mid 2000s patriot at the end of his career who did he stomp on the person's head with andre gerard of, of the cowboys when the Titans were playing the Cowboys. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. I think I I've to... seen, I remember seeing the video. I've seen the video before. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's Albert Hainsworth. That's who it is. Yeah. But he got a big contract from Washington and really didn't uh, do much did not with pan it. Out yeah. there. Uh, Washington, um, Baltimore. Uh, let me, geez, I feel like this should be easy. There's got to be a bunch of them because they're so close. Well, I, I could think of one for sure because he went, to the Redskins the year after he was on the Super Bowl team, which is Tony Banks, played for the Skins. So that's that's a definite one. And he'd probably be low on the rarity score. Yeah, we'll go with him. 3%. All right. Not bad. That just leaves the Browns. And, I mean, you can't tell me there haven't been one of those crummy quarterbacks who's bounced around between these two teams here. <laughs> I don't like I, I, I want to think, I like think about all the quarterbacks. Hold on. Well, I was thinking, it was like Jason Campbell ever with the Browns? Oh, well, RG3. RG3 would definitely be. RG3. I think Jason Campbell list. definitely played for the Browns. I think he did. I mean, I'm positive about RG3 because he was on. Yeah. I think he was the quarterback in 2016 when they almost went winless and beat the Chargers in week 16. And then the next year, they actually did go winless. I think that was the sequence. Or was it the other way around? Either way, it was that was like the one game they beat. The Char- I think it was 2016. They beat the Chargers, which was funny because the Chargers had beaten the Falcons that year, and the Falcons went to the Super Bowl. And it was like, I don't think the Falcons can win the Super Bowl when they're the team that lost to the team that lost to the Browns. I remember thinking that <laughs> at the time. So it was 2016, and yeah, so RG3 would be my would be my guy. Of course, RG3 we could have used him for Redskins Ravens. Now that I'm thinking about it, that's true. Yeah, but. This works out better because now we have now we have that in the and Robert Griffith was a good player, by the way, who I may have paid for the Browns too at one point. Vikings. Now look at that. Curious. Nailed the grid. One thirty. Pretty good score, I'd say. I think yeah. is it the lower? I think it's the lower score you get on the rarity score. Not the score. lower rarity score, yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's jump into baseball here. Uh, obviously very big week. I have six teams that I want to, six teams, not 16, six teams that I want to talk about. I want to start with the teams that are starting to surge. You're starting to see a, you know, an uplift from them. This is a big moment for these teams, the D-backs. They just swept the Red Sox in Boston. They Mm -hmm. also swept the Marlins. So they're on a six game win streak. If I'm correct, I think they play tonight. Yes. They are four games up. For the number one wild card spot, and yeah, six straight wins. So the D backs, give, give me something on the D backs. They just need to get healthy. I mean, they're doing this with a, a rash of injuries. Cattell Marte is now on the IL. Gabby Moreno is out. Christian Walker's been out. And those guys, they've been able to fill the void. Uh, Adrian Del Castillo has been great at catching rookie. Uh, Josh Bell, they picked up, got off to a hot start. Replacing Walker, they're just now getting Eduardo Rodriguez and Merrill Kelly back. Um, the bullpen's been strong. I mean, they 
you know, sometimes these teams, you don't know, like the Rangers had a World Series hangover, it looks like, or maybe that's just typical Bruce Bochy teams don't make the playoffs after they get there. But sometimes teams that lose the World Series have a little bit of that edge of like the unfinished business. They have a huge four game series next weekend in Arizona with the Dodgers. It's the last time they meet in the regular season. The D-backs have the lead five to four in the season series. So even a split potentially would be big because Arizona would win the season series, which would give them the edge in any potential tiebreaker should they end up with the same record at the end of the year. Um, it's been really impressive, really impressive because they they had this torrid pacing. Last time we were talking, I think we're saying like, well, they're not going to sustain this. And then sure enough, they went out, they got swept by the Rays. And a couple of those were brutal losses. I think one, they were down like six to one, came back, tied it and lost in 12 innings. So um, for them to bounce back when six straight on the road to close out that road trip, they look like they're going to be a problem for these teams in the National League this year. The only difference, the only difference, well, two, potentially health. We'll see where they're at. And they're not going to sneak up on anyone this year the way they did last year as yeah. I think they were the sixth seed last year, right? They were the last team in. So, um, you know, they'll, they'll have a little bit of a target on their back. But they will be the underdog if they face the Dodgers or the Phillies. And they loved that role last year. It served them really well. Probably served them well this time. They – they're still three games out of the division as well. Yeah. So this is a very, very tight race right now. And that, again, that series, I mean, if everything goes right for them, you could see Arizona in first place. If they if they can somehow pull out a sweep, they're, you know, uh, assuming, you know, they stay three games back, of course. Um, you could have Arizona suddenly looking at the number one seed. Yeah, really crazy because they were – under 500 past the halfway mark of the season, I think. And so, you know, I don't think Tori Lavallo gets enough credit, you know, did a great job last year navigating them through what was really kind of an average season. They won 84 games in the regular season, but they got in, they figured out playing their best baseball, you know, it, it stinks for them that they probably won't have Cattell Marte for that series. Uh, whereas the Dodgers are getting fully healthy. Marte has been, to me, the MVP runner up to Otani in the National League. Hard to replace his bat, but they have so many other guys performing well right now that they could still potentially make a run at winning that series. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Tori Lovello, former Red Sox bench manager or bench coach. My next team is the Royals. Bobby Witt Jr. is Ooh. the only person standing in front of Aaron Judge for the Triple Crown right now. He's got a 12 point lead in batting average. And it feels like it's shrinking every single day. Um, they took two from Cleveland and then lost two of three versus Philly. But they are w within a game of the AL Central League right now. Yeah, I've been high on the Royals all year. I, I think they've got, you know, the opportunity to, even if they go in as like the number two seed, they're going to be under the radar, in my opinion. You know, just being young, being out of the Central. They haven't been to the postseason since... They won it all in 2015. Um, the the only, well, the big concern that I have is the starting pitching of late has not been that great. We've seen Brady Singer struggle. We've seen Seth Lugo struggle. Bullpen, they addressed that with the Lucas Urseg uh, pickup, but in general, bullpen hasn't been great. But man, it would be in the same way that we've been hearing, like, boy, it's so great to see Otani in the postseason. It'd be great to see an exciting young player like Bobby Witt Jr. in the postseason. And you know, from watching... Well, maybe you don't, and you were young, but the Royals, when they went to the World Series a decade ago, boy, that place was electric. And there's something yeah. about these cities and these teams that don't go every year and don't take it for granted the way that Dodgers and Yankees fans probably do that makes that energy even more of a factor for those teams when they do get there. So Kansas City's got a real shot in what I think is a not an overwhelmingly good American League. And they're only a game out after sweeping a doubleheader against the Guardians yesterday. Yeah, they have um, – th this is a crowded central right now. you got three teams that are, you know, making realistic pushes. Uh, Detroit has played kind of well. I mean, they're nine games out at this point. They're, they're, you know, playoff chances are slipping day by day. Um, but they are – yeah, they're at 66 wins right now. Um, but Kansas City, I think I had them winning their division this – I can't remember. We did it – actually, we talked about it last week. Um, but I think I might have had them winning the division. Uh, so good on me. And you were high on them too. Um, yeah, they're great value. Yeah. Has them at 11 to one to win the pennant right now. Wow. That's a good one. 
yeah. take that all day. Uh, Salvador Perez was also playing wiffle ball in a local neighborhood this weekend. So that's just, that's just awesome. I mean, that just shows the vibes are high. He's had a emergence, uh, a renaissance, I think is the better word for him. Um, he is just leading this team. It's, it's really important. I think to have a guy that is, was there, you know, 10 years ago and he's still here there. He's leading now this young core. Um, I will, I would love to see the Royals. I don't care that they're in Kansas city. Um, you know, the Chiefs are uh, Chiefs are the Chiefs. I mean, listen, the, the Chiefs are already getting disrespected by USA flag football now. Mm-hmm. They're just adding fuel to the fire. The Raiders are adding fuel to the fire. But I would love to see the Royals when that place is – when they're good, that place is bumping. Um, I remember when they won in the year before in 14 when they went to the World Series. I was a – you could have called me a diehard Royals fan at that point because the Red Sox were horrible. I was rooting for them every single day. I wanted to see them win. Um, And then the Braves, they took two of three from Philly, two of three from Washington. They beat the Twins last night, and suddenly they're like six games back. They got a month to go. You got 30-something games left to go, but they're six games back of Philly. And, you know, now there's that thought, God, maybe maybe they're going to do this thing. They might, might be able to make a push. And you know, take Philly for the uh, for the NL East. Yeah, I mean, they they got off to a really hot start last night against the against the Twins. You know, they've they've been down this road before. They seem like a team that'd be more dangerous as an underdog. It's just all the injuries. It's it's fair to wonder does that really show up in the postseason? You know, guys like Acuna, Strider, uh, Albies, Austin Riley. It's it's just crazy how many key guys are out for them, and yet they still keep finding a way. And this weekend, they have the Phillies as well uh, for a four-game set in Philly. So that's going to be – that could decide this division. Um, if, if Philly can kind of put their foot down and, and establish their dominance, you could see them being eight or nine games out heading into September, um, which obviously wouldn't push them out of the playoffs. But, you know, it's going to make that division really hard. Or you could have an NL West-type race going into – September. Um, it's going to be exciting. I didn't really want to talk about the Mets. They've been playing a lot better. They took two or three from your Orioles uh, last week, which is a big win for the Mets. I think they really needed that. Yeah, the Mets, like, they're so scrappy. I mean, they're three games back of the Braves. Uh, I think they still have one series left of the Braves. I have to look. But the the bullpen is still a question mark. I think, you know, unfortunately, they just lost Paul Blackburn to an injury and that was a, a big pickup. Uh, but Sean Manaya has been pitching great. You know, they're getting, I think, better production from their starting rotation than they thought. And they score runs. They lost a brutal game to San Diego the other day at a two run lead in the eighth inning. Yeah. You know, they they always feel like they're just a little short. You know what I mean? It's perfect Mets. They're, they are the yeah. little brother to the Yankees. They are just a little short. Um, they have a big, Big stretch coming up. Um, They're going to see Arizona uh, tonight. Yeah, tonight. And then they see Philly on the 13th for three in Philly. They see Washington, which, you know, winning a division game is important. Then they see Philly again in New York for four in mid to late September. And then they got Atlanta and Milwaukee, the final two series of the season. So that that final 10-game stretch will probably decide their season. Yeah. If, you know, they don't mets it. They, um, if they don't mets it up earlier. If they don't mets it up earlier. Correct. <laughs> Correct. They got um, a very and then, tough stretch. Uh, yeah. Three, three teams falling right now or, you know, falling. The Red Sox. This was a really tough week. They, they took four of six from Houston and Baltimore. And, 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 you know, as a Sox fan, it felt like, okay, like you get, we're getting Cassis back now. We're going to be adding some pitchers. Rich Hill, 44-year-old Rich Hill, is being called up. Um, They have activated him to the uh, active roster, so he's going to be playing within the next few days. They needed a bullpen boost because the bullpen's been horrible. And just just like that, they had five straight losses. They got swept in the doubleheader yesterday, although they did make history. Danny Jansen, uh, Mm. future trivia answer. Um, Make sure to remember that one. They're five games out of a wild card spot now, and the Royal thing, it's – it just feels like every day, just every loss is more and more important. And it's just, it's a stab in the heart every single time. Um, they got 31 games to go, though. They got a lot of ground to make up in those 31. 
The American League wild card has gotten trickier now with the Royals resurgence, you know, or, yeah. you know, the twins are not playing great. I mean, it's now it's five games with the twins and I'm not sure I, I have to look at the Red Sox schedule, um, but it seems like they've got a little bit of a, uh, a challenging stretch coming up uh, with the exception of a series against the White Sox, right? They've you know, Orioles and Yankees is an entire week next week or two weeks. And then, you know, they actually, they do play Minnesota. They get three games with them at home. So that if they can hang on long enough, that could be their shot. If they could sweep that series to maybe yeah, they, get in. They got three left with Toronto, which I think when we went through it last week and I said, uh, Houston, you know, winning this Houston series is going to be really important. They did not win the Arizona series. They got, you know, they got swept in Fenway. That really hurts. You had to, you at least had to take one from there and, and, you know, make something out of nothing. I said Toronto would be tough. They are. They're going to be tough. Uh, Detroit next. Detroit is, again, they're playing pretty good ball right now. Um, they're not going to be great, but Detroit always plays us tough. The Mets, we actually always play the Mets really well. I don't really know why, at least as of the last probably 10 years. Um, and then after the White Sox, yeah, you got Baltimore, New York for four, in Tampa for three, Minnesota for three, Toronto in Toronto for three, and then the final series of the season is versus Tampa and Fenway. Um, so you have a really difficult stretch coming up. And they had to, they got to win games against, against the crappy teams, even, even like the Mets. You got to consider them a crappy team at that point. Well, yeah, yeah, but no one's crappier than the White Sox. You got three games against That's them, true. Yeah. and will the White Sox make their own history? Um, They're they, at a hundred, right? Hundred losses. One hundred and one, thirty-one and one hundred and one. So if they go ten and twenty the rest of the way, they will set the futility record. And their schedule's not well. They do have actually a couple of winnable series, but you know, I mean, no, nothing's a winnable series with them. Uh, they've got. Uh, Texas now, and they got the Mets, Orioles, Red Sox, Guardians, who they're actually five and five against, funny enough. But then Angels, then the Padres, but then the Angels again, and the Tigers to close out the year. I feel like they're going to at least avoid solely setting the record. I feel like they're going to win for no reason. They're going to get to 42 or 43 wins. Of the remaining games on the White Sox schedule, here are the three most expensive tickets that are available tickets as low as $22 tickets as low as $18 mm. I'm sorry tickets as low as $28 and tickets as low as 20 and then tickets as low as 22 um, the rest are just sitting tickets as low as $5 tickets as low as $3 uh, you got a $1 ticket against Oakland uh, nine fifteen. So if you want to, or no, the Angels Monday nine sixteen. So if you want to go to the Angels game on a Monday night, uh, you can get in there for a dollar. <laughs> and why would you waste that dollar on that ball game? <laughs> why indeed? Um, and then I did also have the Twins. Um, the Twins have lost their last two series. They're two and a half back at Cleveland now. Buxton and Correa, two of their biggest players, are on the IL heading into September. Um, they are. It feels like they're just kind of grasping at this point to stay in that playoff spot. Um, and, you know, the Red Sox are doing their darndest to help them out. Uh, yeah. Jeez. I mean, who – let me think. The A's. Do you think people thought the A's were going to be worse than the White Sox this year? Yeah. I think they did. I think they re – actually, I'm thinking back to the, you know, game one. We thought it was going to be a – like major league situation, except, you know, they don't win the, they don't win the pennant. Yeah. Well, they don't want to win the pennant. The A's, they want to yeah. stink so they can just feel better about playing in a minor league stadium next year. Now the A's have not been that bad. They're not, you know, I mean the 56 and 75, I think if you told somebody that that would be their record and that they'd only be the third worst team in the American league. And the people would say, well, you know, they had a solid year. So you know, but knowing the A's, they'll, they'll mess that up somehow. They are not eliminated as well. Um, the Angels are also worse than the A's right now. Yeah, which the is... Angels are. I mean, when you talk about moribund franchises and, you know, teams that have really bungled a great window, 
you know, having Otani and Trout and yeah. It's just awful, awful franchise. I mean, it, you know, they won the they World They didn't make the playoffs two. with them. They didn't even play a playoff game with those two guys. Yeah, without the- has gone once in his career, and they were swept in 2014 by the Royals. And um, it's just so sad. I mean, and, and, to, and just insult to injury, they don't trade Otani last year when I felt like they should have. Um, and... You know, and now they're watching him down the freeway doing great with the Dodgers. I mean, that's just got to be even worse. That's even worse than if he went to the Astros, in my opinion, or or Mariners, you know, in the division. It's just, it's just got to hurt, you know. Yeah. And and apparently, I mean, the report was that Otani at least gave him a chance to match the Dodgers' offer. I, think he, I still don't think he would have gone back, but who knows if the Angels had really made a push. Uh, but just it's just terrible the angels are awful yeah we are um yeah i'm gonna go to the orioles the orioles i also have on my falling um they have definitely not been playing their best baseball as of late two games back in new york right now for the division lost that series to the mets and then they split with houston um and then they are uh, two up on kansas city right now for the number one wild card yeah, the the honestly, they could have lost all four of those games to Houston. They really pulled a rabbit out in in those two wins. And the the depth, I mean, the lack I say the lack of depth, but the injuries are just killing them, especially on the pitching front. When you think about Bradish, Wells, and Means, you'd lost those guys earlier in the year. Now you've lost Grayson Rodriguez to the IL. You've lost Zach Eflin, who had come in and pitched great since they acquired him from Tampa Bay. They've lost Jacob Webb and Danny Coulomb in the bullpen. They were in a situation Sunday where they had um, a tie game against the Astros in the seventh inning. They normally would have set up their bullpen where Yenye Cano and Sir Anthony Dominguez would have pitched, you know, at least the eighth and ninth. They had to use Birch Smith, like a waiver pickup or something, who's been awful, gives up back-to-back homers in the seventh, and then it's just... You know, that that's kind of the reality of where they're at right now. They're also, they've got Ryan Mountcastle dealing with an injury. They've got Jordan Westberg. I mean, they've just had so much misfortune with injuries compared to, at least compared to the Yankees. I know other teams have had some uh, rashes of injuries, but, um, and now the Orioles have to play the Dodgers in LA for three games starting tonight. So this is a really bad time for them to be dealing with injuries. The good news is, it will get better for them schedule wise. They, I know they have the White Sox next week at home for three. They, they have to take advantage of that. They've got the Rockies this weekend first in Colorado. So they've got White Sox and Rays after. And they got Boston and Detroit. They've got to you know at least play probably five hundred that road trip, and then San Francisco and Detroit, and that leads up to what is going to be a difficult final week, a six game road trip against the Yankees and the Twins to finish the year. So they've got some built in, you know, cushion in a sense with the schedule a little bit that they can take advantage of. But yeah, all, all the injuries, especially the pitching injuries just really worry me. And if they can't get at least a couple of those key guys back down the stretch, I don't see them surviving very far in the postseason. Yeah. Uh, we are on, I guess we're on record watch for judge. Right. Like we have to do this thing yeah. where they're going to are they if they cut into any sport for the American League record again, I'm just I'm going to be done. You just don't the, the league record just does not really matter anymore. It, it really never did. I feel like they try to they tried to force NL. us. You mean AL versus NL? Yeah, like the, the American League home run record, it just doesn't really matter. Like, it's not one of those. It's not every, it's not the race everyone's like, you know, you're not doing Mark McGuire versus Sammy Sosa for the National League record. No, you're doing it for the league record. There's an outside chance he gets it. I, I feel like there's definitely an outside chance. He has turned on the gas since he uh, got ejected for the first time in his career. It's like, you're going to eject me? Okay, I'm just going to tear the league apart. Um, I don't think... I don't know. I mean, what do you think? Do you think we're going to see a triple crown from him? Ooh, um, this year I don't think he's going to get there because of the because I think he'll hit he'll finish below Bobby Witt. But at some point in his career, yeah, maybe. I mean, I think Otani. I feel like Otani would have a better opportunity. Although, who knows? I mean, if Otani's batting leadoff, may hurt his RBI chances. 
Yeah, he's well, he's forty forty too, right? He just hit the forty forty club, yeah. which is crazy. Fastest ever. I mean, my thought, or a lot of people's thought, was that he's able to do that this year because he's not pitching, so he's he can be a little more free in terms of running and not as worried about how that's going to affect his pitching and his in between days and all that. So I, I'm pretty sure we won't see him do that next year, at least the stolen bases part. But he could get to 50-50. I mean, they had it at, at even money on the, the books, right, when he hit the 40-40 mark. Now it's gone in favor of no a little bit. But um, it is it is pretty unbelievable. And, you know, I, I wish that these guys were playing for, like, the Reds and the, you know, Twins and not the Yankees and the Dodgers, right? Why is it always those teams have the generational player? I mean, obviously, Otani wasn't a Dodger originally. It's kind of the the Dodger way, but, you know, Judge is a a Yankee through and through, although he could have been a giant. He had an opportunity to go there, but you knew he wasn't leaving. Yeah, Arson Judge, that's who they signed, not Aaron Judge. That's right. Arson. Shohei's stolen bases year by year. Uh, he has went, where is it, 10, 12, 7, 26 in 2021, which was his highest at that point, 11, 20, and then 40. So there has to be something to the uh, pitching, you know, pitching versus non-pitching thing. Yeah, what were his stolen base totals in 2019? Because that's, he had 2019, he was 12, but he only, he had 425 plate appearances, 106 games. So when he plays a relatively full season, he did, let's see. Yeah, he played 155 in 2021. He had 26 stolen bases. 157 in 2022, he had 11. And 135, which really isn't that close to a full season. Um, he had 20. Right, and he, he had 20 in 135 games last year. So yeah. he wouldn't have gotten a 40, but maybe he could have gotten a 30 potentially. But, um, it's, yeah, it's ridiculous. I mean, then these guys are in the primes of their career. Uh, so it's... You know, I'd say on one hand, it's exciting to watch for sure. On the other hand, it's again, it's like, man, wouldn't it be more fun if we got to watch them on more of a low key team that, you know, more people would be rooting for. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. We got a little bit of time. Let's let's do our let's do a base our uh, baseball grid, I guess. I was going to save that. We didn't have the time. Um, let's do it. We We nailed the football one. Got to go two for two here. All right. Here we go. So we got Angels, uh, Rangers, and played the outfield, and then Nationals, Cardinals, and 2,000-plus hits in their career. Um, so we don't need an I mean, Angel Jason Worth, you could go for the Nationals. Sure. No, I was joking. I said it's we don't need an Angel in the outfield here. Because oh, the yeah. Angels are on the left. Yeah, yeah, sure. Jason Worth, you could go um, Roger Bernadina, the original Shark, before Baby Shark, Gerardo Parra. Um, yeah, Roger Bernadina. I always liked him. Just, you know, those were the – he was like the, right when the Nats were getting better. Um, let's mm -hmm. see. Cardinals. I like paying homage to the 90s, uh, so I'm going to go with Ray Lankford. If it's going to – Lankford, L-A-N-K. Yeah. How rare is he? Go, 2%. Okay. 2%, yeah. 2,000 hits in their career and as an outfielder. Um, I mean, you could go anyone here, um, you know, any big-name outfielder. I mean, Mr. October. Ichiro. Ichiro, that's a good one. Um, it's a really old one, like Ted Williams. That'd be that'd be a funny one. Sure. Um, well, we're thinking. I mean, yeah, that's two thousand. But what? Two thousand. Yeah, I feel like Ted, I feel like a, a super obvious one, and no one's gonna use it. Ted, yeah, sure. Two percent. Wow, for the splendid splinter. Two thousand hits in their career. You have eight. You could do Adrian Beltre for uh, the. Rangers. Did he play for the Angels too? Uh, oh. No, Dodgers. Dodgers. Did Josh Hamilton have 2,000 hits? Don't know. Do uh, uh, well, Rafael Palmero. But again, do they do they have to all be with Texas? No. 
I think they just had to play for them. Yeah, yeah. Well, Rafi has yeah, three thousand hits, so you could go. You could go, Rafi. I think everyone would go with Beltre. I think Rafi's a little more under the radar in that sense. Yeah, twelve percent. Twelve percent. Angels, two thousand hits. Well, that's. Uh, I mean, Pujols obviously got three thousand. Um, so Dude, I mean, Trout has got to have two thousand hits at this point. Yeah. Uh, let's do. Yeah, we'll do Trout. No, oh, he doesn't. No. I knew Pujols no. was a gi- was a given. I knew that was a given, so we passed up the easy one. <sighs> Oh, no, no. Oh, Damn. I don't want to use the other ones. Nats, Rangers. Oof. Scherzer, obviously. Could be. And if you're wondering, and I, now I can look it up, Mike Trout has 1,648 career hits, so a little ways to go. Rangers, Cardinals. Well, I, you know what? We could go with Arthur Rhodes because he won. He was guaranteed a World Series ring because he played for both teams that year. I ended up on the winning side with St. Louis. I, I liked Arthur Rhodes. He was a, uh, a good good reliever for the Orioles in the 90s as well. Uh, Nats, Angels, let's see. We can go either one here. We can go Cards, Angels, or Nats, Angels. Um, I have a very rare Rendon. one. Rendon. Anthony well, Rendon's the easiest obvious one. one. I was going to say, if you want to go real rarity score, I think Trevor got pitched for both the Nats and the Angels. All right, 173 yeah. rarity. Not well, bad. here, come on, let, let's let's at least come up with one for Nats Cardinals yeah. since we, we didn't get that opportunity. So Gott was 0.2%. Um, Angels, well, Pujols, of course. I guess we could have just used him there and tried to come up with another Angel at 2,000 hits. Uh, let's see. Well, you, you can always try Edwin Jackson, but I don't think he... I don't think he was. I'm pretty sure he oh. wasn't. I don't even I think it'll let me. Here, it won't let you. In. I just want to yeah. come up with one for source of pride. Yeah, let's see. That's Cardinals. Or Angels Cardinals, sorry. Big big hero of, of uh, the Cardinals, David Freeze. Could be oh, one. that's right. Yeah, he did play with the Angels. Pirates, Dodgers also, yeah. Um, yeah, good one. And I also did not – I did not look at any list. So No, I just no, to pull David it up Freeze was – David Freeze was a good one. I almost want to say Mark Zipchinski. I know he pitched for the Cardinals. I think he may have been an angel at some point. Scrabble. Lackey. I'm looking at the list now. John Lackey. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because I think he was towards the end, right? Towards the very end of his career. Yeah, later in his career. But it wasn't his last stop. I think the Cubs were his last stop. Oh, yeah, that's true. Oh, Dexter Fowler, former Cub. Yep. Um, yep, Dexter. Let's see. You said Zipchinski. Yeah, Mark, I can tell you here. I'm looking at his his name's impossible to spell. He never did pitch for the Angels, so I was wrong. He was with the Cardinals when they won their World Series, but uh, not not with the uh, – Some just – oh, Wade LeBlanc. I would never have guessed There's that one. one. The former Oriole, uh, briefly. Let's see. Jeff Weaver, not Jared Weaver. I thought that was right. Jared Weaver for a second. Um, Eckstein, David Eckstein, World Series MVP. Oh. I'm not looking at the list, but of course, David Eckstein. Jose Quintana. I uh, wouldn't have thought of that one. Yeah, but Eckstein, Eckstein won a ring with the Angels and the Cardinals, and he was the MVP of the World Series for the Cardinals, I think, in 06, if I'm not mistaken. Let's see, who else? There's a, this is a big list, actually. I just want to find one more well-known one. Yeah, so we missed a few obvious ones, I guess. Yeah. Bobby Bonds. Bobby Bonds, Bobby Bonds. was an angel and a cardinal. Um, I assume that's, yeah, that's his father. All right. Anyways, we're all done. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe, the whole thing. Uh, we are preparing for football season, so... We have some stuff coming out probably, I don't know if we're going to do it next week or the week after, but we'll have a nice little schedule of, of, of different content coming out for that. But again, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and we'll see you next week.